Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to First Tuesdays. First Tuesdays is a monthly webinar series hosted by the Washington State Library. And I wanted to give you just a little bit of uh, background and tech support information. So, ah, well, let's see. Suddenly I advanced too fast. All right, first of all, Facilitator, that's me. My name's Nona Burling. I'm the person who arranges and hosts the First Tuesdays. We have two people online today as technical support, Jeremy Stroud and Joe Olivar. So if you're having any difficulty, you might want to write down one of these numbers. And if you have any difficulty, you can email or call them and they will be happy to help you. But this is our new software. And so far, once we figure out how to make it work, it's been pretty, um, pretty seamless, so hopefully no one will have any difficulty. We, um, this, the webinars are brought to you by the State Library, as I said, and also from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which provides us the funding to host these webinars. So I wanted to welcome you today to this webinar on sensory story times. We have a great presenter today named Mandy Harris, one of my colleagues um, attended a pre-conference this year at PNLA, and Mandy was one of the presenters there, and she was just blown away by the presentation and the entire pre-conference, she said, which was one of the best she'd ever attended. So she got me in touch with Mandy, and I'm very grateful because I think this is a really great topic. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. If I, I've heard from a few people that you're watching this as a group, so one person may have registered but there may be more people watching. If you are watching as a group, it would be really helpful to us for you to put in the chat box how many people are attending and what state you're coming in from, just for our own statistics. So anyway, let me introduce Mandy to you. Mandy, I, I love her bio that she wrote up. Mandy Harris calls herself an accidental librarian, and perhaps I love that because I feel that way a bit myself. She said, there's been no happier accident for someone who used to alphabetize her, alphabetize her books for fun as a kid. She is the youth service specialist at the Community Library Network in Kootenay and Shoshone counties in Idaho, where she's worked for the past four years. Five days a week, she spends her morning leading early learning programs, such as the sensory story time she'll be talking about, a French story time, and a toddler story time. Her afternoons are spent with elementary schoolers leading after school programs and community outreaches. She's a busy woman. She adores getting to see children fall in love with reading, learning, and the world around them. So in addition to this, Mandy also is in her second year at the University of Washington MLIS program. At the UWI school, she is chair of the Student Association for Rural and Small Libraries, as well as the online representative for iYouth, the student organization for those interested in children and teen librarianship and youth services. She recently returned from a three and a half week exploration of children's literature, libraries, and museums in England. In her spare time, how does she have any spare time? Mandy likes to read. She said, surprising, she knows. She likes to hike and to drink way too much coffee. So coffee apparently is the secret to Mandy's success. And I will now stop talking and turn this over to Mandy. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for that introduction, No, no. All right, I'm going to share my screen and let's hope that it's very seamless. Here we go. Perlo. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stick with the PowerPoint one because it looks like that's going to be the easiest and most seamless one. So we'll go okay, with that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. So good morning, everyone. Um, and no, no, do you see the slide? Full I screen? do. Perfect. Per Yay, seamless transition. I yeah. wish that was that. <laughs> That was my big fear this morning. So thank you everyone, thank you for attending and thank you um, Nono for having me. It's a real honor to be here. So I'm a big talker, but I also have uh, my book baby story time at 1030. And so I'm gonna try to make sure we're all out of here in a timely fashion. I've got a timer next to me, which as we'll discuss is a pretty important thing in sensory story time. And I'd like to apologize. I uh, got sick last week and it's not, it's kind of lingering. It's not quite going away. So um, if I have to mute my mic for a coughing fit, I apologize, but I'll try not to burst anyone's eardrums and I'll be sure to mute, mute my mic there. All right, so let's get started. 
I wanted to start with who I am and who I am not. Uh, because, and I'm going to come back to this later, but I value own voices, especially in the library. So I want to make it very clear this morning that I am speaking as someone who has led Sensory Storytime for several years. I have experience with this program, but when I speak of autism and sensory processing disorder, I am speaking as someone who is neurotypical. I am not on the autism spectrum. Um, I have experience with sensory integration issues personally, but I don't have sensory processing disorder. So um, as I speak, I'm speaking as a programmer and a story time leader. And I'll come back to this because I got some good resources for own voices in the library um, and librarianship of those who are on the autism spectrum. Um, but especially because I'm very aware of my role as an information mediator. So especially with kids, um, I, I want to make it, I want to be aware that I'm kind of that person who's providing them access to information. And so I'm doing this in a neurotypical way. So I try to do a lot of research and do a lot of readings um, by those who are on the autism spectrum, who are within that community. Um, so I also use uh, person first language. So I usually say like people with autism. Now within the autism community, there has been some debate about person first language saying people with autism versus um, an autistic person. Um, so as somebody who's not in the community, I for now use person first language. That may change as, um, we, uh, the people in the autism community um, share more on what they prefer. And so I say neurotypical, um, and you're gonna hear me use those words neurotypical, so people who aren't on the autism spectrum, who don't have sensory processing disorder, um, neurodivergent, those are gonna be the people on the autism spectrum, and then um, neurodiverse, so when, we have a, when I talk about a neurodiverse story time, or a neurodiverse classroom. I just mean where we uh, a room where we have children specifically for this program I'm discussing this morning, um, working up so we have people on the spectrum and people who are not on the spectrum working alongside and le learning alongside one another. All right, so why sensory story time? I have this super cute video of my sensory story time kiddos playing after sensory story time in our play group and it would have charmed your socks off and it was adorable and I did have permission from the parents to share it but then I started and I've when I've presented in person before I have played it but um, since this is going to be archived and it's on the internet the video of the kids um, I didn't want them to ever like stumble across this and find a video of themselves playing and I, so I Ixnade that video, um, but just know it was really cute and it would have been a super charming way to start the morning. So just picture like the cutest thing you've ever seen. All right, so how I got started with Sensory Storytime because I think it's um, important to understand why these programs are important. So in traditional story time, I had a little girl and she had cerebral palsy and autism and she loved story time. She and her mom and dad came all of the time, but I noticed that they would often have to leave early and um, because she would get overwhelmed and overstimulated, the noise and the chaos and the abrupt transitions of story time would just be overwhelming to her. And she would leave early or she would have a meltdown and get upset. And it, I began to wonder if I've got this little girl in my traditional story time, uh, how many other kiddos in the community aren't attending story time for fear of these same issues? So. I, we were pitching summer programming ideas because at the Community Library Network, that's often when we start new programs is we do them as kind of a special program for the summer. And so I said to my boss, um, Karen Yother, who's fantastic, I said to her, hey, I'm thinking of starting a sensory story time or I think it would be cool if we started a sensory story time. And she said, all right, when do you want to do it? Because Karen's super great. And she'll say yes. Uh, yes, and that important improv tactic. Yes, and so yes, and when and how and uh, how are you going to do it and how are you going to pay for it? So um, I started it that summer with a two hundred and fifty dollar grant from our friends of the library. Actually, uh, yeah, I started it with a two hundred and fifty dollar grant from our friends of the library, and I'm going to go into how I set it up and what I bought and the resources I used. So, and this this is the most important thing. 
I think when I think of sensory story time. When I had that very first sensory story time um, in July, our very first session of the special session of the summer, a mom came up to me afterwards and she had brought her six-year-old son. And she said that was the first time that they had set foot in the library since her son had been diagnosed with autism three years earlier. So at the age of three, her son was diagnosed with autism. And from that moment on, she did not feel comfortable bringing her son into the library. And that is huge for me because I believe that libraries should be here for everyone, that we should reflect the entirety of our community in our programming and in our books. And so just that one little statement showed there was a real need for this in my community. And just by having this program, we were able to show this segment of our community that they were welcome in our building. Uh, so we have this focus on libraries being disruptive and schools being disruptive. Like we think of disruption as actually a good thing. I attended the National Summer Learning Conference uh, last year and the theme was dare to disrupt, like disrupt the status quo, provide the greatest programming and learning for our kids. So we view disruption as a good thing, but parents do not. They can often feel, especially parents of kids with special needs, they're worried about disruption. They're afraid of how other people are going to react to their kids. So we can disrupt that unwelcome feeling that these children and parents have by making the libraries a place where these kids can disrupt safely and in ways that help them grow. So in sensory story time, what we're doing is we're not creating a 100% calm atmosphere where no meltdowns ever happen. I, I wanna make that clear. That's not what we're doing. Instead, we are creating a place where these children can be themselves and where parents can be themselves. We're creating an information ground where caregivers and parents can share knowledge and reassurances with one another. We are creating a place of yes. So um, moving on, before we understand sensory story time, I wanted to give a little breakdown of sensory processing disorder. Oh, and uh, no, no, I just wanted to let you know, if anybody has any questions, feel free to interrupt, um, and I, I can um, absolutely share, because um, I see a few chats are popping up. All right. Let's see here. Okay. Can everyone, no, no, can everyone hear me? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I should say, speak for myself, I guess. I certainly okay. can hear. Oh, and someone else just put in the chat. Yes, they hear you. Oh, perfect. I just saw a few chats popping up and I wanted to make sure like it wasn't a panic, like Mandy, no one can hear you. Nope. All You're right. You're coming through loud and clear. Thank you. Perfect. So um, what is sensory processing disorder? Basically, it's when the brain doesn't detect, process, or organize sensory input into appropriate responses. And what really helped me understand this is when somebody explained it to me that we all experience sensory processing disorder at different times for different reasons. Think of how you feel when you're sleep deprived. Um, other things can cause sensory processing disorder, pregnancy, PMS, when we're sick. These can all cause our bodies and our brains to not interpret sensory input in appropriate ways. So when you're sleep deprived, how does everything feel? Everything's a little bit too loud, too much, lights can be too bright, we can't always focus on what people are saying to us or we interpret, we misinterpret their tone because we're not quite hearing it properly. Um, when we're sleep deprived, if we're reading, we may not be able to fully process what we're reading or even what we're seeing in front of us. Our memories can be a little fuzzy. So when you're thinking of um, kiddos with sensory processing disorder, how I always remember it is how I feel when I'm sick or sleep deprived. So um, yeah, sensory processing disorder, it's just, and I'm gonna go into more of what that's, um, the breakdown of the different aspects of sensory processing disorder. So there are three patterns within sensory processing disorder. The first pattern is sensory modulation disorder. And this is probably what we hear of or think of the most 
when we think sensory processing disorder. So the first is over-responsive. So um, these are those kiddos that have uh, like a predisposition, they respond too much, too soon, or too long to sensory stimuli that um, other people might find kind of tolerable. So these are those kids that are gonna get overstimulated really quickly. So they're gonna have a hard time with too much noise or too bright lights or too much motion around them. They're gonna, they're gonna um, maybe be triggered into meltdowns by that. Um, the second type of sensory modulation disorder is under responsive. So these are the kiddos that aren't going to react as much to sensory stimuli. Um, maybe their responses are muted or um, they might not get as much out of it. So these are those kiddos, and I'm going to go into more of this later, where we have um, sensory stimulating things such as um, yucky balls or things that they can feel and touch. And the other kiddos, uh, the third type of sensory modulation disorder is sensory seeking. So um, these are those the kids that really, they just want a lot of sensory stimulation. They can't quite get enough. Um, but that being said, even when they get that sensory input, their brains are still not processing it in typical ways. And because of that, it, it's not satisfying that drive for more sensory input and more sensory stimulation. The second pattern of sensory processing disorder is sensory-based motor disorder. So this is postural disorder. So these kiddos aren't going to have a good perception of uh, like where their body is positioned. So this kind of relates to that proprioceptive input um, and kind of their vestibular, their balance. Um, they might not have... Um, well-developed movement patterns. They might not have good core strength. Um, and so they might appear to not have as much uh, muscle strength or they might, their endurance might not be as great. Uh, the second type of sensory-based motor disorder is dyspraxia. And um, so these kiddos might uh, um, have a hard time doing new movement patterns. And so um, a lot of these are why we do a lot of repetition, especially with dyspraxia. So they have a, a hard time learning new like dance moves or gross motor skills um, because they have a hard time combining that thinking and planning of skilled movements with actually physically enacting those skilled movements. All right, so the third type of sensory process, the third pattern rather, of sensory processing disorder is sensory discrimination disorder. So we always think of the fact that we have five senses. We've got auditory, our hearing, we have visual, our seeing, tactile, touch, gustatory, our taste, and olfactory, our sense of smell. So we have these five senses, but as it relates to sensory processing disorder, we actually have um, eight senses. So the other senses that we have that we don't often think of, we have our vestibular um, sense. So this is how our body moves through, through space or against gravity. So it's basically our balance. Um, you can have, so it's our, our sense of balance, basically. And then we also have our sense, our proprioceptive sense. So um, kiddos with difficulty with their proprioceptive input, they, um, have trouble taking that sensory input and processing it into their muscles and joints. So um, kids with vestibular issues have trouble taking that sensory input and positioning themselves in the universe or kind of in the space around them, um, kind of with that balanced sort of geometry of how we interact with the world. So proprioceptive is they have difficulty interpreting um, just that sensory input they get to their muscles and joints. So kind of external stimuli there. All of these are very external stimuli, but the last one, that interoception, that's internal stimuli. And this one, I was just doing some reading the other day. This one's actually a relatively new um, aspect that people are just kind of starting to talk about and learn about. And that interoception is, um, they have difficulty interpreting their stimulation from their own internal organs. So this is, um, when you may not interpret or understand the need to go to the bathroom or um, you, they, it, well, and it could be, I should go back. It can be difficulty interpreting it or feeling it, but also that difficulty interpreting it may be that they might misunderstand what that internal sense is representing. So they might complain of stomach aches or alternately not 
he, um, understand that they're feeling hungry. So inter interoception is that internal sensory input they're getting from within their own bodies. All right, so moving on. So why do we, oh, and I will, actually, I'm gonna go back to this one because um, I had an experience yesterday with um, like the tactile gustatory. I had a, kid, a brand new kiddo in sensory story time. We just launched sensory story time for the fall session yesterday. And I had a kiddo um, who is very um, taste and, and orally fixated. And he left his chewy in the car and I was turning around to turn on some music. And he walked up to me and started chewing on me. And I usually wear yoga pants in sensory story time because we do a lot of yoga, but thank goodness I was wearing jeans yesterday. So um, yeah, he started, he started, he came up and he started chewing on me and it, it didn't cause any problem. Um, but that's why a lot of these kiddos, they have chewies. Um, otherwise they might start chewing on things that they shouldn't be chewing on, like their story time leader or another child. And um, that can cause some problems. Um, it all, it was, it worked out okay. Didn't break the skin. It was fine. I'm, we get used to things in story time. All right, so sensory processing disorder and autism. Why am I telling you about sensory processing disorder and autism? Well, I have this little graph here. Now, I'm a library person, I'm not a mathematician, so this is probably not to scale or an appropriate ratio. There's a great chart on um, the STAR Center for Sensory Processing Disorder that breaks this down actually mathematically. Um, so sensory processing disorder and autism. 70% of kiddos with autism also have sensory processing disorder. The reverse is not true. So the majority of people with sensory processing disorder do not have autism, but the majority of people with autism do have sensory processing disorder. So it's very important that we understand that um, sensory processing disorder when we're creating an environment uh, where we're having a lot of kiddos with autism. And it's also very important that we understand those multiple types of sensory processing disorder because so one kiddo might have sensory-based motor disorder and another kiddo might have sensory discrimination disorder while a third might have just sensory modulation disorder or you could have a kiddo that has some combination of all three um, some combination of tactile, auditory, visual, vestibular. So it's understand, important to understand these because you're going to have kiddos with a wide range of sensory needs in story time. Um, and so this is just to give you kind of a background basis and idea of what these kiddos are coming in to your story time with and their experiences. So moving on. Oh, so I Googled um how to lead a good webinar and it said to put in pictures and have like a break slide and make something funny so i love leslie nope i find a lot of inspiration in her and even though she's very anti-library so i found my one of my favorite leslie nope quotes which is the library is the worst group of people ever assembled in history they're mean conniving rude and extremely well read which makes them very dangerous um, and I just love that because I find a lot of inspiration in Leslie Nope because she's such a go-getter. She does everything, and um, but she truly cares about her community. And I believe that we as librarians, we truly care about our community. What we're doing is we're serving. We're in the public service sector. We're here to serve our community. And I just really love librarians. I love the library. I love what uh, community based place it is. I think that we're, we have a community center. And I also believe that I, while I love to read and I love books and I love watching kids fall in love with books and reading, I don't think I'm in the book business. I think of myself as in the information business. Um, and so I'm just here to facilitate and connect kids and people with information and with one another. And Leslie Nope is all about connections and building those connections. So I popped this in because when I Googled, great librarian, by the way, I just used Google. I always feel a little guilty using Google as a librarian, but I popped this in because I love Leslie Nope, even though she's very anti-library, which I always find hilarious because after nurses, librarians are the second most trusted profession in the US. I didn't put a source on there for the slide, but I, there was a study that came out, I think Pew did it, that um, after nurses, librarians are the second most trusted. Um, 
profession in the US. So yeah, I like Leslie here. I am gonna pop back here because I wanted to talk a little bit more about sensory processing disorder and autism, um, just to give a few statistics about it. So according to the CDC, some of these statistics vary from source to source. So I'm going by the CDC and I double checked these statistics last night um, just to make sure that I wasn't, you know, um, giving false data or, you know, data that's no longer accurate. So basically around one in 68 American children is on the autism spectrum. This is a tenfold increase, and so I'm going to directly quote from the CDC here. This is a tenfold increase in prevalence in 40 years. And this is only partly explained by improved diagnosis and awareness. Um, so autism is also four to five times more common in boys than girls. In sensory story time, I have noticed I have slightly more boys than girls, but it, it, it's pretty close to a 60-40, 70-30 split. So it's not anywhere. I don't have that four to five times more boys than I do girls in story time. Uh, so in the US, about three million individuals are on the autism spectrum. And um, so, yeah, we're, we've got this community and we are here to serve them. All right, so back to my Leslie Nope meme there. Okay, so getting started. I've given you the background and um, how do we get started? So this is a picture of my story time setup. And basically, so I'm in the small meeting room. Sometimes we have this beautiful large meeting room and I love my setup in there because I can just really spread out and give some really great spaces for the kids. So you'll see I have a carpet and I have a lot of things on that carpet. I would never in traditional story time have this many things on my carpet because it would just be a distraction. Um, but in sensory story time, these things are not a distraction. They are your tools and they are tools for the kiddos and they are very helpful. So um, the first thing that I have um, up on my board, and I will have a picture of this on the next slide, is a visual schedule. And I'll go over the visual schedule on the next slide. But number one, I have a visual schedule up. I put a schedule up in my story time and I send it out ahead of time. Number two, repetition. Probably 80% of my story time does not change from week to week. And this is pretty similar to my other story times. Most of us use a set structure in our story time, but sometimes in my traditional story times, I'll go you know, kind of off book a little bit or I'll change it up from week to week or we might have a party one week instead of story, traditional story time. Um, I don't do that in sensory story time. Repetition is key. And along with repetition, I give very clear transitions and I give very clear warnings when a transition is coming. Um, we, we, can't, we don't wanna surprise kiddos on the spectrum. They need to be warned because they need to have time for their brains to process that. So repetition and timers and counting into things. So a timer, if you're looking to set up a story time, get a timer or have some sort or a countdown. A lot of the occupational therapists that bring kids to my program just use their iPhone and the kids know and they'll watch them set it and then really they love to help turn off the timer. Number three are sensory objects. You'll see on the carpet there, I have sensory objects. I have a slide that breaks down how much I spent and I'll talk about where I got them. Um, so I have um, those sensory objects. And a lot of the sensory objects that I have will work both for kiddos who are sensory over-responsive, sensory under-responsive, and sensory craving. I have uh, a sensory roller coaster. That was not in my first round of purchases, but I got a second grant because I read on a blog that a sensory roller coaster um, is really great for those kiddos who need that sensory input. And we just used it yesterday. And it's actually been a really great purchase for the library. <laughs> it's pretty big and it's hard to find a place to store it, but um, we've used it in a lot of different programs. So if you've got room in your budget and you can justify it, um, it's a step two roller coaster and the kids love it. Um, and it's a really great treat after story time. Mandy? Uh, yes. Oh, we do have a question. Uh, yeah. It was asked, can you give an example of your clear warnings during transitions? Absolutely. Yes, I can. So um, I, and I'm going to go over a little bit of this on the next slide, but I can, um, I don't mind talking and repeating myself. So um, one example of what I do is 
I send the visual schedule out ahead of time, several days, enough to give parents and kids a chance to go over everything together so the kids know what to expect and when to expect it and what's going to be different that week, which usually the only things that are different are uh, my books and my uh, activity after story time. Then when story time starts, I give a warning because they come in and they play and everybody chats and I give a warning before story time is going to start probably in like, okay, two minutes and then, you know, a timer, two minutes and story time will start. And then we count down into story time starting. Like we all do it together. It's collaborative. And so we're all working towards that goal of the transition together. Then we go over the schedule together. And this is a really great opportunity for my kids who have been coming for a while to step into a role of leader because I believe in story time as a conversation and a co I, co I believe in a collaborative story time. I don't believe in a performance story time. I think we're there to have a conversation. I'm there to facilitate. I know how to read and I know good literacy tips, but we're kind of there to collaborate. So, I, a lot of my kiddos can't read, but they can see the pictures. And so we go over the schedule and the ones who've been coming enough, I will say, okay, what's this? And they'll tell me, and I have them tell me in order as I point to it, what each thing is. And some of them are remembering it because they can remember what comes after what, and some are being cued by the picture on my visual schedule. And then I announce what I'm going to do before I do it. So after we go over the whole schedule, okay, now I'm going to sing the welcome song. We're going to sing our welcome song together. Um, now I'm going to do this. Uh, where I really do the, a lot of very, the strongest um, kind of lead-ins and transitions um, is really like after bubbles, after the really fun things. Um, bubbles, we always do bubbles now. <laughs> bubbles are great, I'm gonna talk about bubbles later. Um, we, I do a timer and a countdown after transitioning from bubbles or the parachute or anything that's very stimulating um, because I don't always shy away from things that are very stimulating. I, I do limit how many stimulating things I do. Um, and I, I work with my occupational therapists who come and the parents and we, we discuss and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, um, I have a, another yeah. follow-up when you yeah. have a moment. Yeah, um, absolutely. Feel free I, to interrupt me anytime. I'm a big talker. Do you email out to a set list of parents and how do you communicate it ahead of time? Uh, actually, there's a few questions in here. Uh, what would you recommend for those story, sensory story times that don't have email signups or don't get enough signups to warrant email lists and instead get more drop-ins? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we on ours list registration preferred rather than registration required. So what I do, and and there's a couple of things I would like to do um, that I haven't done yet. I would like to start posting our visual schedule, um, maybe switching to a new format where I can post it online and I can have it as a link under my description. Um, and then I would have to really make sure that I'm uploading that and making and fixing that link each week. So um, that's something I'm looking to switch to. So I do registration preferred rather than registration required. So I do get drop-ins. Uh, what I do is um, I get a variety of, yeah, I get a wide variety of drop-ins versus people emailing or calling. So when somebody emails or calls to ask me about it, I will take their information and then I'll add them to the list. When I get drop-ins, I ask them if they would like to be on the list. And then um, what I do is I have an iPad out and it's, I have a Google form and they, I just have them pop their information into the Google form. And I redo that several times a year. Like I, yesterday, I just launched my new autumn 2017 Google form. And I, so yeah, I have that and then I email that out. When I do get drop-ins, I tell people, you know, I do email out a story time, so feel free to register. And some people don't want, I've had a couple of people who, who don't e either don't have an email address or don't feel the need for it. Um, and then, but a lot of who I get, and this is gonna vary from community to community. I have a really strong partnership that has actually formed because of this story time with a local developmental preschool. So um, a lot of my um, kiddos come with their occupational therapists from local developmental preschools. So I get more registration that way. And then I have a few kiddos who come with parents. And then a lot of the kiddos who come with parents come 
because they've either attended one of my other story times and have heard about it that way, or they've heard about it from a therapist. So they'll usually contact me. Um, Drop-ins, um, it just kind of, so I'm guaranteed a good number of people in my story time that are registered. And then drop-ins, we kind of handle that as it comes. Did that, is that helpful or do, any more information? Good. I'll just keep. Um, perfect. I'll, okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, I also have a limited capacity. The room that you're looking at here has um, a fire code limit of 29 people, and I hope no fire marshals are listening right now. I'll just say this: uh, hypothetically, last spring I started getting. May I mean I may or may not have started getting 35 to 40 people in sensory story time, which in and of itself is way too many people, but in this small of a room, it was way too many people. So I started two back-to-back -back programs. Um, and so a limited capacity is going to be your friend because we want this to be as calm of a place as possible. No guarantee, we can never guarantee a fully calm environment. That's just not the nature of the world. And that's not the nature of humans. We can never guarantee a fully calm environment, but we can do our best to create a calm space or in a space where kids can be themselves. So a limited capacity, that is why registration preferred. That way I kind of know. But again, I'm one of those people, I, you can probably tell, I'm not super strict on anything. I'm not a particularly like serious, strict person. I'm just like library extroverts. And so I'm pretty go with the flow, play it by ear sort of person. Um, so as much as possible, I try to limit the capacity and then I see what my community needs and then I react and adjust and evolve accordingly. So last spring I started getting more people than I had initially. So we launched two programs and luckily I had room in my schedule for that. Uh, and then along with that limited capacity, part of what fills up the room is a lot of these kiddos, like any story time, are going to be coming with an adult. But in sensory story time, at least in my personal experience, because I do have that relationship with those developmental preschools, it tends to be closer to a one-to-one -one ratio than some of my other story times, because a lot of these kiddos are coming with their occupational therapist. And sometimes there might even be a two to three adult to child ratio, because some kids are coming with an occupational therapist and a parent. So it does make the capacity, um, the room fill up a little bit more quickly than some of my other story times. So I also have, you'll see that tent in the back, that is a self calming zone. It's a little harder in the smaller room. In the large room, I have a barrier of a couple tables. And inside the tent, I have some of my sensory objects. This is just a space, if a kid needs time away, they can go sit in the tent. Um, there are no rules about the tent. Some kids will go sit and spend the whole story time in the tent um, some, and they'll listen to me read. And there's a hole in the top of the tent and they like to pop their head out and just keep their body in the tent and their head outside the tent and watch me read. And that's why I also have the chairs around. It's to give a feeling of safety and security. Sometimes the adults will sit in the chairs. Sometimes they sit on the carpet with the kids. I really leave it up to whatever they are most comfortable with and whatever is best for the child in that particular moment. So the chairs are just there to offer that feeling of security and then to also separate the carpet time from that self-calming zone. I also have calming facets in the room. I have blue light filters and I'll show those. I believe it's on the next slide. Yes, it is on the next slide. Um, I have blue light filters. I have an essential oil diffuser that goes in the room. I, I know a colleague of mine down at the Santa Barbara Library, she told me, a friend of mine, she told me that essential oil diffusers are very hit and miss for her. And she has some people who cannot stand them and some people who request them. So I'll just say that they can be a little bit controversial because not everybody likes them. I had read it on a sensory story time blog and I decided to try it. And I've had nothing but like rave reviews from patrons. And I've started, um, this is one of those things that I took from sensory story time and integrated into my other story times. I will leave that up to you. It, however, I mean, that's just something I do personally. I haven't had any complaints and I've only had um, a lot of parents walking in and taking in a deep breath. I mean, in my baby story time and my toddler story time, my French story time, and I, I've started using it in my after school program. And I get a lot of adults actually who walk in and take a deep breath and say, oh, it smells so wonderful in here. And I'm wondering if part of the benefit of it 
is that it gets the adults actually in a calmer, more relaxed, pleasant state of mind, which then helps that energy flow for everyone. So it could be that the essential oils are just nice for us adults and help us feel a little bit better about everything. And then maybe our energy is transferring that way. Um, and then so short interactive books. Um, I, uh, so like toddler uh, level books, something short, repetitive. A lot of sensory story time leaders might read a book more than once. Uh, and interactive books, I've had great luck with iPad stories especially like monster at the end of this book and another monster at the end of this book, because then we can make it collaborative. And that leads into number eight tasks. We're sharing, taking turns and working collaboratively are key. When my kids come in, we do our weather flannel um, and everybody gets a piece of the weather and they get to walk up or crawl up and put it on the board and they get that sensory input and, um, and they get to also practice taking turns and sharing because uh, we're also working towards like any story time, we're building good members of society and we need to share and take turns and work collaboratively um, so it, with everyone. So um, we're, we're taking all of those things that we do in traditional story time and we're just making them work for kiddos who just, who process things a little bit differently. Um, and the other thing, um, speaking of working collaboratively, partnerships. So when I first started Sensory Storytime, I made up a flyer on Library Aware and I took it around different places. And I'm very lucky because just kind of across a couple streets is a developmental preschool. But I connected with several local de developmental preschools, um, occupational therapists, schools, social services, and I just, I took it around. Uh, but word of mouth has been one of my best friends and my best means of advertising for this program. I also advertised it in my traditional story times because you never know who, I mean, one of my moms in traditional story times, she doesn't have a kiddo on the spectrum or sensory processing disorder, but she herself is an occupational therapist. And so she took it back to her place of work and she advertised it for me there. And, um, also, I've had parents in my traditional story time who hear me talking about it and they'll mention, oh, you know, I've, I've been thinking my child may have some sensory issues or I've been talking to my doctor about perhaps uh, my child being on the autism spectrum. Can I come try sensory story time? And um, absolutely. I also don't limit sensory story time to kiddos on, only on the autism spectrum or with sensory processing disorder or special needs. Any child is welcome in my story time, and I've had a few neurotypical kids attend. And studies have shown that um, having a group of neurodiverse kids does help both uh, the neurotypical and the neurodivergent. Um, but I think that tends to be more when they get into elementary school, working alongside each other. So I don't limit it only, but I, it, I, it, I make it clear that it's geared to those with special needs. So partnerships and advertisement and a flyer and just getting out and talking to people and talking about it um, more love that kind of one on one interaction. All right. And so I'm wow, I'm a good photographer. <laughs> Look at that blurry, that blurry picture in the bottom. So it's a good thing I'm a librarian and not a, a professional photographer. So these were my initial purchases. I started Sensory Storytime with a $250 grant from my friends of the library. The prices that you see on the screen are not the prices that I paid several years ago. These are, I wanted to make sure they were all updated, so I researched last night. So I'm gonna start in the upper left-hand corner, that hula hoop with that purple circle in the middle. So hula hoops are a dollar at the Dollar Tree. And actually, I lied to you. The hula hoops were not one of my initial expenses. Um, how the hula hoops came about were uh, when I started doing yoga with the kids in sensory story time. And my kiddos who are sensory craving, those kiddos that they love a lot of sensory input, these are the kids who will hug strangers or hug without asking. And we need to remind them, oh, we ask before we touch or we ask before we hug. Those, super, those kids who crave all that sensory input, they, uh, they liked to crawl under me and on top of me during yoga. And this was a suggestion from one of the um, occupational therapists, she said, you know, a really great way to establish personal boundaries and personal borders are hula hoops. And so I started putting out hula hoops on the carpet and everybody gets their own hula hoop. 
and they sit inside and that is their clearly marked boundary of their own personal space. And I also have my own hula hoop because I have my personal space. And then we can make this clearly visually defined boundary because if you have trouble um, processing emotion and facial expressions and trouble recognizing sensory input, then you're not gonna be able to read people's physical cues. I apologize, I need to cough really quickly. <coughs> and I did not mute. You're going to have trouble um, recognizing when people are uncomfortable with you invading their personal boundaries. So those hula hoops are a great, solid, visual, sensory boundary that you can mark for kiddos. All right, so those were not one of my initial outlays. They're a dollar at the Dollar Tree. We already had a bunch left over from summer reading, so I just grabbed those and incorporated those into my sensory story time. The middle thing is a bitty bottom by Abilitations, and it is a circle that the kids can sit on, and inside is gel and beads, so it's sensory input, and it helps those kids who need to move as they sit because it allows for wiggling, and it also provides sensory stimulation, sensory input. It's a little bit heavy, so if they want to sit it on their laps, they get that calming sensory input. The $26 um, for the Bitty Bottom is about average. The $13 is because I found them on clearance at, on walmart.com last night. So if you're looking to jump on, I mean, that's like 50% off. So if you're looking to get some of those really quickly, I would hop on that. That was as of last night, $13 on Walmart. All right, so the next one, I apologize. I'm gonna take a drink of water because I feel a huge fluish coughing fit coming on. So I apologize for that. All right, so. <coughs> I figured 40 minutes of talking was about my limit before I started coughing. So four for $38.99, those are classroom blue light filters. I had the names of these labeled on my Google slide, but not on my PowerPoint. So those are blue light filters. <coughs> I apologize for that. All right, so four for $38.99, they just help um, create a calming environment. <coughs> I am so sorry, <laughs> the hazards of working with children. They create a calming environment. Um, the next are teeter poppers. These allow kids to lay in them and be rocked, or they can sit in them and wiggle. The uh, tactile shapes in the bottom left, a lot of times the occupational therapists or the parents will roll them up and down kids' arms for sensory stimulation and also for calming. The weighted stuffed animals in the middle, that very blurry picture, those are no longer available. Um, I looked last night, they are, but they're really expensive, but you can find sensory or weighted stuffed animals from anywhere from 25 to $55 a piece. And then the bottom right are yucky balls. Those um, are very popular and I have a lot of parents who ask me about them. And those are 28, <coughs> <coughs> I am so sorry. My boss must be listening to my webinar because she just brought me tea. Karen is, I am so sorry. My boss is listening to my webinar and she just brought me warm water. Um, six for 28 to $50. So, um, and yeah, aren't you guys glad that you're listening to the webinar with the person who, uh, is, has been sick for a week and a half. I am so sorry. It's a good thing you can't like catch a cold or a flu or whatever I've got um, over, <laughs> over a webinar. It's much better than being around me coughing in person. All right, so six for 28 to $50, super popular. My parents take pictures and buy them all the time. All right, moving on. Here's my visual schedule. Wow, super fancy, Mandy, right? Yeah, so a lot of people have fantastic visual schedule boards. This is like my initial when I first started. I didn't have room. I didn't have room or money for a visual schedule board, so I printed off and laminated pictures. This is my setup. So welcome song, ABCs, we sing them to a couple different tunes. Then we do our weather song and our collaborative weather flannel. We do our opening dance. My opening dance is Jim Gill's 
um, is a Jim Gell song. <coughs> <coughs> and it's a lot of gross motor movement. And then we do a finger play for our fine motor skills, our open them, shut them, classic. Then we do some animal yoga. My boss is great, Karen, who just brought me the water because I'm coughing all over the place. She um, lets me wear yoga clothes, um, professional yoga clothes on Mondays when I do sensory story time because we do yoga and we do yoga moves and we always end. It's called corpse pose, but I feel weird telling a bunch of little kids to do corpse pose. So we call it sleepy kitty because that's what our picture looks like. And uh, we do yoga and then we end on our backs and sleepy kitty and we do some very relaxing breathing. And I've actually started incorporating animal yoga into my French story time. This is another one of those things that I incorporate into my story time because I've actually got quite a few kids who come to French story time who also come to sensory story time. So my French story time is actually very neurodiverse. And I have a lot of kiddos who come to that as well. Um, so I've incorporated yoga and then I can teach kids yoga poses and names for animals in French. Then we do the yoga pokey. My coworker says this is the worst of the pokies. I love the yoga pokey. Um, it's great. There's several different versions on YouTube. If you Google yoga pokey, we stretch our arms in, we stretch our arms out, and then we reach our arms in and we stretch ourselves out. Maybe she doesn't like it because it rhymes out without and that's kind of some lazy rhyming. I don't know. I love the yoga pokey. I do it in my nature brary in the summer times. I do it in some of my, in my toddler story time. Um, so a lot of yoga I've started incorporating into my other story times because it's just a great way to get kids moving yet relaxed. Then um, we do one book. Um, this one is uh, Sezup, but um, I also, one of my developmental preschools told me that one of their strategic plans was um, to talk about feelings and emotions. So usually my first book is a feelings or emotions book. And then we do bubbles. Bubbles are your best friend. Bubbles will work for those kids who need calming, the kids who need sensory input, the kids who um, just need a little bit of a nice break from story time. So we do several minutes of bubbles. And then we use the timer and we warn before we turn off bubbles and still every time for a couple of the kiddos, even those who have been coming for a while, it's a rough transition. And I will say rough transitions are okay because rough transitions happen in life. So a lot of what we're doing in story time is modeling in a controlled way, those things that everybody has to deal with in life. So um, bubbles are great. Sometimes you see this visual schedule, like I've said, I'm not a super strict person. Sometimes it's not going to work, and I'll talk about that later. And we might just go straight to bubbles if we're having a particularly rough day. Then I do a couple more books, mood for many. We sing our goodbye song, and then I do some sort of sensory activity. Sometimes it's a craft. Sometimes it's the roller coaster. Sometimes it's my sensory balance beam. Uh, sometimes it's dancing. And then we do free play. Free play is fun for the kids, but why I do free play is the same reason we partly do play groups and other story times. It is for the parents. It's for the caregivers. It's for them to exchange information. It's an information ground. They can provide reassurances. They can chat with each other. They can share things that are coming up. And it's also a great opportunity for me to learn from them and also to just have a nice place where I can chat and interact with the kids. So we always end with a free play sort of play group. Um, so yeah, some people have a really fancy visual schedule. I also tried, to, I played around with different formats that I do my visual schedule on. Um, and actually what my parents ended up preferring were Word documents, images and Word documents because they wanted something that they could understand how to use and they knew how to use and that they could um, access easily and they didn't have to learn a new thing. So I've tried different things. Um, so, and then I email it out the Friday before a Monday story time. And then on my registration form, I ask for definitely email. Um, I also ask for the child's name and age. Also, any special needs I need to be aware of, allergies or accommodations that I need to know. Um, but I also ask for the kids' interests because I'm there to serve them and I wanna make sure I do a story time that we're working on collaboratively that fits their interests. Because, and a lot of times kids with autism are very hyper-focused on certain topics, whether it be trains or dinosaurs. They can tell you a lot about very certain topics. So it's, kind of, it's fun to incorporate those topics in. And like I said before, at the beginning of story time, we go over the schedule together. 
Um, kids with autism like and need repetition. Repetition. About 80% of my story time stays the same from week to week. And that's the part they prefer. The part where we have the rougher time is with the new things. And that's why we introduce a few new things each week because we need to get used to new things. Um, and then, so yeah, and free play is designed as that social time. All right, we're kind of coming up on the end, which is good because I'm almost done with my slides. This is perfect. All right, so. Uh, we did have a, a question yeah. and I believe you already covered it. Uh, one more slide back actually. Okay. Um, the little knobbly things, uh, yeah. what were those called again? So um, those are tactile shapes. If you go on Amazon and you search tactile or sensory shapes, I think they were called tactile sensory shapes. Um, yeah, just tactile shapes, that's what you'll get. Or tactile blocks, tactile blocks will also work. And just so you know, there are some individuals saying, hope you feel better. And <laughs> people are understanding. Oh, good. Um, also, does anybody else feel like it started way earlier? this year. I keep saying that to everybody. I know I said that to Jeremy and Nono this morning and Jeremy last week. It, cold and flu season is starting like super early this year, right? I don't usually get this till November or December, but it started in September. So maybe I'm just getting it out of the way early. I was yeah. about to say that. We're getting it out of the way early. Don't have to deal with it later. Right, exactly. Just knocking it out while the weather's still nice <laughs> and while I have to speak in front of a bunch of people. All right. So you're a library nerd. Be a library nerd. And I shouldn't say you're a library nerd. I should say I'm a library nerd. So what's a library nerd? Library nerds know things. Library nerds are curious. Library nerds learn things. You do not have to be an expert in autism or sensory processing disorder. The parents, teachers, and occupational therapists who come, they are the experts. So what a library nerd facilitates information. Library nerds know how to research. They know how to program. They know literacy tips. They know literacy skills. They know how to run a story time. You are in such a great place to learn as you're going along. You don't have to know everything day one. And you're not, it's like any story time. You're not going to know everything that first time out. You're going to do your research and you're going to be as well prepared as possible. But those, that's why I do that play group. It's not just for the parents. It's for me too. I have learned so many phenomenal tips and tactics, especially from those occupational therapists who come. And those parents are going to be experts in their own children. And they're going to be able to help you out and tell you things, or they're going to be able to recognize when their kiddo is having a rough time and they're going to be able to help you with those transitions. So you're a library nerd, be a library nerd, because another thing a library nerd knows is there is no predict predicting a program. I started this program as a program for kids on the spectrum, but it's like that, you know, field of dreams. I was an 80s baby, 90s kid. So field of dreams reference here, Kevin Costner, um, if you build it, they will come. Yesterday was my first sensory story time back for fall. I started this program as a program for kids on the spectrum or kids with sensory processing disorder, and I used the words or other special needs. I had three visually impaired children join yesterday. So, and one came with her occupational therapist, and that occupational therapist stayed behind and gave me invaluable tips on how to add in aspects for visually impaired learners, such as a tactile calendar to go along with my visual schedule. So I've got a visual schedule. That's not gonna serve kids who are visually impaired. So what I'm gonna do is take a big key ring and I'm gonna put different objects that relate to our schedule on the key ring and be able to pass it out to my kids who are visually impaired. I'm also gonna have a few extras out because I know that if the other kids notice some kids with a tactile schedule, they're gonna want it too. Or some kids might not be interested. So I'm gonna have a few extra and they call it a tactile calendar. Uh, so I learned that because I hadn't had, I've had kids who are visually impaired in my traditional story time before, but I had three kiddos in my sensory story time. So again, my community is showing me what they need and what they want and my story time will evolve because of that. Then at the end of last year, our local group foster home brought half a dozen kiddos with fetal alcohol syndrome and or uh, in utero drug exposure. I've had kids with Down syndrome come. I've had a woman, she's physically 25, but her developmental age is three. So I have four other story times during the week. And in any given week, I'm leading anywhere from like one to four elementary programs, depending on the week. So we've all got a lot going on. I'm a, I'm a library nerd. I know how to do a story time, but I'm also here 
to constantly be learning. That's why I believe in that communication, the collaboration, the conversation. Learn from those people who are in your story time. Um, so. Man, Mandy, this is Nono. Can I interrupt for just yes. a sec? We're coming to the top of the hour. Okay. If you can keep going, we are recording this, but I know that there may be people who need to leave. Um, so we're going to be sending out a link to the recording. If you can't secure, stay for the end of story time, assuming Mandy can keep going, um, just just catch up with us on the recording. Okay, back to you, Mandy. Oh, thank you. And I will say I just have um, really three more slides to go through. Um, and so um, you won't miss much if you have to leave. All right, so I'll move on to the next one. Keep calm and read on, unless the reading is going disastrously, in which case read the room and adjust accordingly. So keep calm and read on. I really do mean kind of read the room and know. Kids on the spectrum engage atypically in story time. You are not going to get the same cues that you will in a traditional story time. So engaging atypically, a lot of times kiddos with in, um, sensory processing disorder on the spectrum, they'll turn their back to you and while you're reading. It does not mean that they are not paying attention. It does not mean you've lost them. Um, and sometimes they may make noises that it, you can't quite tell if they're laughing or crying. This is where you can kind of look at the parent or the occupational therapist and they're gonna know the kiddo. Um, some sensory story times, we read a book more than once. Um, I don't do it every week, but I know in some story times, sensory story times, they do every week read a book more than once. I like to use flannel stories to really get the kids engaged and help me tell the story. Um, and we all know sometimes story time, man, it doesn't go the way we have planned and that's okay. We can change the energy flow. That's, I like to go with the flow of energy and not fight it. Um, and sometimes it has nothing to do with you. Um, it, there can be meltdowns. Maybe the kiddo came with a bad energy from the morning. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they're tired. Maybe they're overstimulated. Sometimes it has nothing to do with you. Sometimes it does. I mean, I've got a pretty high energy personality and I've got to remember to really gear down to help contribute to a calm environment. And I know when it's been me. And um, I've just got to shift and adjust my own and gear my personality down. Um, I'm, and then sometimes it has nothing to do with you. One time I left the room after story time, it was during our play group and I left and everything was going great. And I came back and those poor parents and occupational therapists, cause I came down to a room with half a dozen kids in full meltdown. Um, so sometimes it has nothing to do with you and that's okay too. Um, bubbles. That's why I say the bubbles. Sometimes a book's not working an activity is not working. And sometimes it just means we need to work on our transition. And sometimes it means that we should scrap that activity. Or sometimes it means maybe it didn't work this week and let's just turn on some bubbles and some classical music and we're gonna step out of story time for just a little bit and have a calming, soothing break all together and then we'll pop right back in. So last year I tried a surprise basket that I used in my toddler tales because I thought it might help with like, like, you know, surprises and sometimes things don't go according to plan. Surprise basket was not a hit, N not a hit. <laughs> So I don't do surprise basket. I do parachute every so often because I got parachute out. I had a little girl who started last year. I got parachute out and it was a huge trigger for her. She could not handle the parachute. She could not handle it being put away. But even when it came out, she was overstimulated by it. And I chatted with her occupational therapist. I said, should this be something we try? And they said, yes. So we kept trying parachute about every other week and now she can handle it beautifully. So it's about working with the parents and the therapists to know when you should push through and when you should kind of rearrange things. And that little girl who had the roughest time last year came yesterday and she is such a leader in the program now. She was able to tell me, and last year she wasn't speaking. This year she's speaking and she was able, I mean, last year she was three, this year she's four and she's speaking and was able to tell me everything that we were going to do. And she was an incredible leader in the program. And um, a couple of the occupational therapists, I had a couple of new kids who had a rough time yesterday and they looked at me and they're like, you know what? It's going to be fun to watch them grow. And that's what this program is. It is growth from start. I mean, and it's going to be long-term growth. It's not going to just be over a couple of weeks. It's going to be from September through May. You are going to watch these kids grow and learn and transform and just see just really marvelous things. And it's such a treat to watch. Um, to watch them just come into their own and grow into leaders. 
and it is really worth it. As long as you know, like in a story time, tears happen. Tears happen a lot more in sensory story time, and that's okay. Um, a lot of the occupational therapists and the parents, we, you know, sometimes when it's a rough day, all you can do is just laugh, and then you try again next week. All right, so I have some resources for you. Um, these are just a few. I didn't want to overload the slide. I have my email at the end, so if you want more of my intro, um, more of my resources, and then I also have a whole Pinterest board. I should have put that on there. Um, that I have a whole Pinterest board. So I wanted to start with the libraries and autism.org. Um, and libraries and autism.org is the website for libraries and autism were connected. And they have a grant going on right now called the Autism Welcome Here Grant. They are giving away a total of $5,000 for the third year in a row to libraries looking to start sensory story time if you can meet certain of their parameters, including a plan for continuing the program after you've used up the grant funds. So that's a really great opportunity for those of you looking to start a program. That's librariesandautism.org, and it's their Autism Welcome Here grant. Um, ALSK, love ALSK. Um, I used a lot of their blogs when I was setting it up. So they've got Sensory Story Time, a brief how-to guide, and then they've also got programming for children with special needs, children with special needs. I just put part one, but there's other parts. So ALSK is great. Um, I have this book on the shelf right by my desk. It's 101, notice my APA style there. Um, if you notice any mistakes in my APA style, please don't tell my professors and don't tell me. I was so nervous. I was like, oh man, blame Zotero. I, if there's any, you know, it's like a little nerve wracking putting your um, citations up in perfect APA style. And yeah, anyway. So 101 games and activities for children with autism, Asperger's, and sensory processing disorders. Really great resource um, for those sensory friendly activities and games. Um, Eliza Drissang, I'm an iSchooler. Um, Liz Mills and Michelle Martin are two of my professors, um, Annette Goldsmith, and they like Eliza just sings amazing and um, they knew her. And so she wrote this article in 1970, 1977. She's a revolutionary woman and um, she wrote, There are no other children, special children in library media centers. And it was in, it's in School Library Journal. Um, it's just a really, you can see how far we've come and how far we need to go. You can read about what was happening in the 70s. I found on YouTube this great, it's a PowerPoint presentation. It's by Melindra Sanders. I was watching it and I was like, man, why'd they ask me? This one's fantastic. <laughs> this lady's so awesome. So it's, um, if you search on YouTube, starting a sensory story time by Melindra Sanders. She gives a really great breakdown with lots of detail. Even her name's better than mine. I'm like, Melindra Sanders, and I'm just Mandy Harris. Like, um, so her breakdown of starting a sensory story time on YouTube is fantastic. Um, she goes through the whole thing, lots of really great slides. So I would recommend um, starting there. All right, and then own voices. I'm a big believer in own voices. Like I said, I'm not a member of this community. Um, I'm a programmer, so instead I um, like to read um, own voices. There is a man who writes for the ALSC blog, um, Justin Spectrum. That's a pseudonym. And he is um, a children's librarian on the spectrum. Oh, and you can see he doesn't use person-first language. So like I was talking about earlier, some members of the autism community do use person-first, some don't. Um, so yeah, perspectives, perspectives of an autistic children's librarian really great to read about those who work in libraries who are on the spectrum because they're going to have a completely different perspective than those of us who are neurotypical and we can learn a lot from those who are on the spectrum about how to serve those members of our community um, and then um, he also has a book review there's a new children's book a picture book i've got it on my shelf about temple grand and, and he wrote a really great review about it about um, what it gets right and the few things that it gets wrong, but he makes a great point that this is great that this is out here, but we need to have a lot more. So um, it's kind of related to we need diverse books. We do need diverse books, and one aspect of diverse books that we need are books on neurodiversity. Um, so there's by Lawrence, there's this great article. She's also a neurodiverse librarian and it's called loud hands in the library neurodiversity in theory and practice and it's from progressive librarian i reference this article a lot um like i i have read it quite a few times i've referenced it in papers it's just a really great resource for thinking about 
but like no, like the title says, it's a great title. Neurodiversity in Theory and Practice. Theory is great, love theory, but I like to put things into practice and she does in this. So she takes that theory and makes it really usable. And then another one, Neurodiversity in the Library, One Librarian's Experience. And this is from In the Library with the Lead Pipe, which is an, a peer reviewed open source online journal. Um, and it's just another really great resource if you're looking for um, librarianship from a, a perspective of somebody on the spectrum. All right, let's see. Oh, here's me. Questions, comments, I crossed out critiques and said compliments instead, but this is the first webinar I've ever led. So if you have any advice, any critiques, feel free, even though I crossed it out, that's just a joke. Um, you can send them my way. Any questions, anything at all, feel free. Mandy H at communitylibrary.net. It is Mandy with an I. Um, I was named after the Barry Manilow song, but my dad decided to spell my name with an I because I was born in the 80s and that's just what you did in the 80s. So Mandy H at communitylibrary.net. Um, so for questions, comments, critiques, or compliments, feel free to send those my way. Um, and I've got a few more minutes. My story time's all set up. It doesn't have to start for 20 minutes. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask now. Any, let's see. And we do have a comment. Uh, no, no, there are two watching from Seattle. Yeah, I, I can see okay. that. Mandy, this has been really great. Thank you so much. And thank you for going over time. For anyone who's still here, once again, we have been recording. And um, we'll send out the link to the recording once it's up and running. And um, when you close out of the webinar you will be you should if all goes right get on your browser a link to a four question survey that we would hope you'll fill out for our own stats that we need to keep and thank you everyone for coming and mandy thank you high energy tons of information i'm processing it and still, still. finding the crud and will be for a while all right and thanks everyone for coming really appreciate it and thank you so much for having me uh, Mandy, just in case you don't see the comment, somebody in here is saying, great job. Never would have guessed it was your first webinar. Oh, perfect. Oh, good. Thank you. That makes me feel good. All right. So I don't see any questions. I do see people logging out. So okay. uh, Mandy, once again, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and okay. um, we'll keep it open just a couple more moments in case anybody has questions. But oh, uh, yeah, and otherwise, thank you. Then.